History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No, it's deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the Auschwitz Volunteer. Yesterday, I was listening to a podcast that is totally unrelated to this topic, but the hosts were talking about a woman they knew who had just turned 101, Mm -hmm. and they were saying, wow, she was born in the year 1920. What a long time ago. (laughs) And it is. That's true. It's 101 years ago. (laughs) But when I thought, or when I heard that, my mind instantly jumped to like, 1920 doesn't seem like 100 plus years ago. Like that woman was born after World War I ended. Yeah. It just got me thinking while experiencing some of the things that we will talk about soon, how the more distant we get from certain parts of history, the quicker they sink into history and not real life experiences. Right. Obviously, what we will be talking about today, as evidenced by the episode title, is Auschwitz and World War II. And that's obviously a very heavy topic. It's something that, you know, we've learned about through history and through history books, even if we haven't necessarily individually researched it extensively. But it's something that people who are still alive today have experienced. I don't know if you've ever, like, listened to any holocaust survivors talk about living in the concentration camps or even not necessarily holocaust survivors but world war ii veterans talk about kind of the things that they saw and what they experienced it's very interesting and heavy but you know it's cool to listen to that firsthand experience but those people are becoming less and less just as we pass through time and it's easy to forget some of the things that actually happened not that long ago. And I think it's important that we don't forget those things. Yeah, I agree as far as it being important to not forget those things and to still hold the lessons that are in them um, dear and to teach them to future generations. It's kind of crazy to me as you're talking, I'm thinking about like what we've lived through that we kind of take for granted that younger generations now are, you know, seem like the past to them. Like, you know, there's, adults now that don't remember that weren't alive to remember 9-11 yeah that's true Uh, well that's it's crazy like living through things that will one day be in a history book (laughs) Mm -hmm. i mean certainly people that would have lived during world war ii and the holocaust probably knew that they were living through history book type things even if they i don't know didn't know that they would live through it at the time (laughs) um but I mean, it's one of those things that you just, you know, that you're in a very important moment in history that, you know, is going to shape the future. <laughs> yeah. One of the things we talked about on a past episode where we talked about the Holocaust specifically was our Dietrich Eckhart episode, where we said that kind of that we both had a little bit of background in learning about the Holocaust just through school. And we both mentioned that if we ever had the opportunity in our travels to visit a concentration camp that we wanted to, even if it wasn't necessarily going to be a fun experience, it would be important. And I want want to use the word unique because it is unique, but I feel like when we use that in talking about travel, it it seems like something that's supposed to be fun and exciting, but it's unique in a different sense. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) So when Reed and I decided to take a trip this year, because we had canceled credit to use, (laughs) courtesy of the pandemic, we decided to go to whatever European countries we were able to get into. And fortunately, um, I mean, I guess fortunately that we were able to even take a trip in 2021 and not obviously get sick from it or have things shut down or anything like that too much. But 
one of the countries that we were able to visit was Germany and specifically Munich. So we decided that we couldn't really go to Munich without doing quite a bit of World War II history <laughs> on our tour. And at, throughout our research, we discovered that there was a concentration camp fairly close to the city of Munich called Dachau. Um, mm -hmm. And while Dachau is nothing at all like Auschwitz that we're going to talk about on this episode, we normally like to start by talking about some of our personal experiences that we can relate to the topic. I think as we get into this episode, you and I will both very confidently not be able to relate to this person at all and right. his experiences. So I just kind of wanted to talk about that trip a little bit and share the closest thing that I have to understanding sort of what these experiences would have been like. I will say that our trip to Munich was not entirely history based and studying World War II. We did You mean try to you have... took a vacation that didn't completely focus on history? <laughs> you know, the point of the trip was researching for the podcast. So Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> very committed to this and investing. It was a business expense, you know. Did you write it off? So yeah, the uh <laughs> it's a write off. <laughs> it's a write off. <laughs> the uh <laughs> leaders of beer off? that we drink. <laughs> <laughs> I just found out that this is a tangent, but I just found out that that Schitt's Creek bit was completely lifted from Seinfeld. I think I mentioned. A oh, really? Ago I've been listening, yeah, to or I've been watching Seinfeld on Netflix. But yeah, that entire scene was like played out almost word for word between Kramer and Jerry. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So we were in Munich, and of course, we we enjoyed some local breweries while we were there, and saw some different things. But we did, of course take in some of the history and especially kind of Hitler's rise to power, which centered in Munich and eventually led to the rest of Germany. But while we were there, and I'm going to try to be sort of chronological with how our trip went, but jump around a little bit, of course. Um, we always like to, I mentioned, do kind of an audio tour or not an audio tour, but like a tour with a local to try to get our bearings in the city. So what we did for Munich, because we weren't booking a ton of tours for COVID reasons, um, we actually did an audio tour this time where we downloaded one that we could listen to on our headphones as we walked around the city and they pointed out landmarks. And one of the things that really stood out to me about Munich is that it's a very modern city, even though mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily look that way, all of the buildings are very new. Um, that reason being that the city of Munich was essentially destroyed through aerial bombings during World War II. Yeah. That's one <laughs> of the I, things I remember from visiting Germany with my family when I was like real little, like first grade, is that like I seeing really monuments. Yeah, my dad worked over there for General Motors, like satellite plants in Europe. And we got to visit him for a couple of weeks. And one of those weeks was in Germany. We were in, um, oh my God, I can't remember the name of the town. That's terrible. Um, it doesn't matter. Anyway, w I, I remember seeing monuments that were around during World War II that were like scattered with little pockmarks and small craters from bomb shrapnel and being like, whoa, you know, we don't really have mm -hmm. anything here in the U.S. that is that marked by, except maybe Pearl Harbor and um, the World Trade Center site. Yeah, I mean, it was cool because they talked about how a lot of the buildings are fairly new as far as when they were constructed. But when Munich was being rebuilt, they intentionally tried to reconstruct it in the old styles. Hmm. So the buildings like look old, but they're, you can tell that they're like not as old as they are supposed to resemble. But one of the interesting things was there's a church right near the, the main plaza of Old Town, Munich. Um, I want to say it's St. Peter's. I should have done research on stuff that I learned several months <laughs> ago. Um, but the, the, even the Nazi party like recognized the historical significance of these buildings and knew that they were about to get bombed and everything else. So they went in and took photographs of everything. They documented everything so that the city could be rebuilt following the war. Of course, I think they expected they them to be the ones to rebuild it, but yeah. it didn't quite work out that way. Um, but then there was a lot of memorials around the city um, to Jewish victims and survivors and the other groups, of course, that were victimized as well throughout the Holocaust. Um, it was really 
interesting to like take it all in and i guess it's kind of the same experience as you would visiting any new city it's just understanding the gravity of what happened there like even there's a very real famous plaza there called odian platz which existed long before the nazi party but it was always used for political and military demonstrations but there are photographs that you can look up of these nazi rallies happening in this plaza with hitler speaking to a massive massive crowd and it's just weird standing there to think that you are in the same place that some of these really not great things happen in history. Right. And one of the things that was pointed out to us on this tour was that as you're walking to this plaza, Odeon Platz, there's a street that is sort of just off the beaten path that was viewed as like a protest type street. So as the city was marching towards these plazas to hear these great speeches the people that didn't agree with the nazi party didn't agree with hitler would duck down the side street to avoid the the nazi rallies that were happening and this street Mm. has kind of been viewed as sort of a monument of people that protested supporting the nazi party at this time yeah on our second day there we went and spent time at the national socialist documentation museum which we spent quite a while there it's about a four-story museum and we probably did it backwards because you were supposed to go from the top down the way it was chronologically set, but we kind of worked our way up. So it was like reading backwards through the, I guess the story of the Holocaust, but it was interesting to read all that, the different things and kind of what led to the Holocaust taking place. Some of the stuff that we talked about in our Dietrich Eckhart episode um, (laughs) made me feel good that my research was okay when we (laughs) did that one. Um, And even I found a little biography of him, on the top floor kind of talking about as one of the people that founded the German workers party and led to kind of the development of someone like Hitler. But one of the more interesting things that they had was a special feature, special exhibit that was audio stories of people that were arrested or taken to the concentration camps, hearing their stories of what they experienced in the camps, hearing their stories of, them being arrested, of their families being arrested, of them being specifically ostracized because of the anti-Jewish laws that were being implemented throughout Munich and throughout Germany. And what made it so powerful was just hearing it in their exact voices, these people talking about their experiences, of course, recorded years and years ago. But to hear their actual voices and see the videos of them talking was hard. It (laughs) It was definitely hard to listen to. And one of the other unique things about this museum was just that the uh, they had kind of a, a theme <laughs> around the museum that was how we view populism today. Mm-hmm. And it was quotes from a book that was written right after the Trump election in 2016. <laughs> Not there it is. specifically saying that, because we talked about it in that episode we did way back when, that we don't necessarily like like to draw those comparisons because there's not really anything that you can accurately compare to what the Nazi party did. I know that's a very easy argument, common argument for people to make to compare almost anything to Nazis, but just to show the influence of populism and how quickly people can turn and how quickly people can believe certain things, the way that they are portrayed or spread through politics and the media and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was a lot of advice on to how to recognize these things and how to prepare yourself to react should the time come that you are in a situation like a lot of people found themselves in Germany in the 1930s. Yeah. Do you remember what those were like, what some of the more standout things were as far as what to look for or how to react? So the book was called on tyranny 20 Hmm. Lessons from the 20th Century. It was by an author, Timothy Snyder. And I don't remember a lot of the quotes. Specifically, they were kind of hung up around the museum. But it talked about just recognizing... Well, number one, how the Founding Fathers specifically tried to warn against the threat that they knew from tyranny. And how it could kind of be modernized to today. How we can recognize those types of threats. Yeah. And specifically, it just talked about people who made these types of grand statements, these grand claims that couldn't necessarily be backed up, but they were intended to skew public opinion or to make people believe certain things, to make people believe that their security was at risk when it really wasn't, or just basically inciting fear without any kind of real backing to it. 
and then just ways that you could protect yourself to be ready for people acting on these people believing them when they weren't necessarily true right um things like i mean this is i guess on the the more ready to react side of it but having a passport (laughs) you know understanding basic survival principles which i don't necessarily think is like we always need to be like that but you know we've said before that democracy is always hanging by a thread and supported by people who believe in it so our (laughs) our comfy life as we know it is only maintained by us continuing to believe in that to fight for it to support it right our last full day that we spent in munich was to be divided between a walking tour throughout the city of munich that was centered around the rise of national socialism and hitler in munich but also touring the dachau concentration camp the, the Nazi walking tour that we did was sort of similar. It went to a lot of the same highlights, but we did get to see specifically like where the beer hall was located that Hitler made all his grand speeches, where he, where the German Workers' Party was founded by Dietrich Eckhart, the hotel where the SS was created. <laughs> so all mm-hmm. these crazy monuments, and a lot of them have actually been repurposed. Like they are not beer halls anymore. They are not serve these buildings are not serving the same purpose that they used to and that that brings up kind of an argument that i was kind of debating my mind and Rita and i talked about a lot when we were over there is how do we preserve these types of buildings that are not remembered in a good way um yeah like the concentration camp specifically a lot of them now are museums that are open to the public which is obviously why we were able to visit one but are they better served in that way are they better just destroyed and not there because it's kind of a symbol to what nazism was um i don't know i i'm curious to hear your thoughts on that because we've talked about you know statues to people that we don't agree with or people that aren't remembered well through the test of history yeah but these aren't necessarily statues they're just more landmarks and historical sites yeah i mean i guess it could kind of go both ways um you could see them still standing as a symbol of the Nazi party. And I think other people would argue that them still standing is a symbol of respect to the people who died there. Um, I think it, the, the difference, I guess, lies in all the nuances of how you approach setting it up as a museum. I don't, I wasn't there, so I don't really know how the museums are set up and though i imagine they're designed to be pretty respectful of the people who suffered there um but in general i guess i do differentiate them from statues where if they're turned into learning resources that accurately portray the events that happened i i don't necessarily agree that they should just be torn down um because it almost seems more disrespectful, like what would happen to that land if they just leveled them all, you know, would it be developed? <laughs> would they build condos on it? Like, yeah, well, that's yeah. I mean, it, it I kind of had that same feeling is that if they tore down the concentration camps and tried to repurpose the land, like what would you even put there? Who would want to build something there beyond what it is? Right. And some of the buildings have been repurposed, like the the Brown House, which it was the Nazi sort of headquarters their main offices that building is still standing it's being used for other things um the beer hall that i mentioned the hotel like those are all still there they're just not necessarily used for the same things the buildings have just been converted remodeled repurposed but the concentration camps themselves still remain and i think for good reason i I think they obviously bring up a lot of pain and um terrible terrible things for the people that were there the people that experienced that um But at the same time, I can't think of another way for people to live that and experience it because there's only so much you can get from reading about it, from listening to a podcast on it, from watching documentaries on it. Like it is a different experience to be there. And that's kind of why we wanted to go to take time out of our day. And so the, the concentration camp that we visited, I mentioned was called Dachau. And Dachau is, it's not... 
Auschwitz. <laughs> that's the main <laughs> takeaway from this, because that's the camp that we're going to talk about, of course. But Dachau was one of the smaller ones, if not the smallest concentration camp. It was also the first one, I believe, that was established. Uh, it opened in 1933, which seems like really, really early in the course of you know, the Holocaust and World War II. It really wasn't open to be how we think of concentration camps. Yeah. It's located just a little bit outside the city of Munich in a town called Dachau. Um, it was about, I think it's only 15 or 20 miles outside the city. We took a train and then a bus to actually get there. So the train goes to the town of Dachau. And when we got off the train there, you wouldn't know that you were so close to what used to be a concentration camp. It just looks like a normal suburban town outside of a major city yeah and then you get on the bus and it takes you there and even when you get off at the bus stop when you're right outside of it you still don't know that you are right next to this type of place Um, it's just a little visitor center that you go check in and then you can kind of make your way through the camp so i've shared with you a little diagram of the camp that is going to kind of help for me explaining to you where we went and what we saw It's going to not make as much sense to people listening along unless you want to Google a diagram of the Dachau, which is spelled D-A-C-H-A-U, concentration camp, right now as you're listening. But we will post it to our social media when this episode publishes so people listening along can kind of get an idea as well. As we got to the camp, we, like I said, made our way to the little visitor center and kind of got some light reading materials to get an idea of what we were seeing and making sure that we were taking it in. And as I was preparing for this episode, I asked Rita to kind of give me what her thoughts were as we were going through it, because, you know, I wanted to remember everything myself, but also make sure I touched on the main highlights too. Uh, The first thing that she mentioned to me was just kind of the heavy feeling in the whole area. Mm -hmm. Even though I'd be willing to bet that everyone there had only read about concentration camps and not actually experienced anything like that. I think just the gravity of where we were and understanding what took place there was palpable. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Everyone was pretty much very respectful of the area. Everything was very calm, very quiet walking through it. We, we did take a couple pictures, which I guess was allowed. We didn't realize until we were pretty much on our way out that we could even take pictures. Um, So we don't have a ton. I'm, undecided if i should even post them but maybe i will when when we publish this but yeah i think it's we didn't take any pictures that you couldn't find just from googling stuff about a concentration camp one of the main things to see with dachau is the gate as you walk in Uh, the gate was i mean it's this big grandiose structure but the specific iron gate that you walk through has the words arbeit macht free on it which is german for work sets you free And this was an inscription that was on pretty much every concentration camp. It's much, much larger on Auschwitz if you look at pictures of that. But it was just one of those things that Dachau was intended to be a political prison. It was a labor camp. So that idea of when you're there, you're put to work and that's what will make you free. That's what will get you out of the concentration camp. And it, in hindsight, the, the perspective that we're looking at the Holocaust is that this is just a blatant lie kind of spitting in the face of the people that were there because most people that went to concentration camps never left. They were either there until they died or they were there until the camps were liberated. So working did not set them free. Once we were inside the camp. And if you're looking at the diagram, that's the, and the gate is that black box on the left. But once you're inside, you kind of walk into this open area on the diagram here, it's labeled as the central kitchen, but this kind of U-shaped building was, well, is now, it's a museum, but at the time, this would have been kind of the main registration type building. That's where the the kitchen was, the dining area, if you want to call it that, um, but they also, every new prisoner was taken there to basically be shaved, bathed, put in the registration system. They'd be tattooed they'd take all their possessions they would give them their prison uniforms so this was kind of like the the main building that every new prisoner would go to initially once they were brought to the camp today it's just this massive massive museum Um, we spent i want to say three 
hours, maybe more in that building alone, just reading everything there was to read. As soon as you went in, it started with the history of all the concentration camps, but specifically Dachau, just talking about how this camp was started, that it was one of the first ones and that it was designed. It has 36, I think, barracks, which are the buildings that the people actually stayed in. Each of those was designed to hold about 200 people. So at its capacity, Dachau should have held about 5,000 prisoners, Mm -hmm. uh, roughly. But then they had, over the years, how many people were actually staying in Dachau. And it started out pretty low. It was only a couple hundred, and then it was a couple thousand. And then at its peak, I want to say they had 78, 90,000 people staying in Dachau at a single time. And you could just tell over the course of the Holocaust how much this camp transitioned from being a political prison to a concentration camp as we know it. We also walked past tons and tons of artifacts that were confiscated from prisoners as they were brought to the camp. And that was one of the harder things to read. It was a lot of ID cards. It was a lot of watches. It was a lot of personal mementos, um, things that they found in their wallets, just anything that you might carry on your person if you lived in 1930. Uh, but it was taken from these people and obviously never returned or never been able to be given back to the families once the camps were liberated. We also read about how they brought reporters to the camp to give off this air of how it was just a labor camp. It was just a prison. It wasn't somewhere where people were being killed or people were being murdered. Um, If they had deaths, it was just because of you know, accidental things or people just couldn't survive the work because it was very difficult work. It was nothing that was intentionally, no one was being killed there, like purposely killed there. The They would bring in these reporters and they would introduce them to some of the healthier prisoners, some of the people that were in better shape to handle the labor at the labor camp and show what a great place it was. And everyone was treated fairly, just these terrible terrible lies about what was actually going on at the camp so that these people would go back to Munich and to report what they saw and it would be just a a lie. People would be told incorrectly what was what the conditions were at the camp and that'll play a role into today's episode of course as to whether or not people actually know what's happening at these concentration camps. And as we went through we started to learn more about all the different people that were there. We learned about of course when we think about the Holocaust, we think about Jews being the main victim, but Dachau was never really a Jewish concentration camp. They did, of course, have a lot of Jewish people that were there as prisoners, but part of the appeal of Dachau to Hitler was that it was in his, what he considered home city of Munich. So he wanted to keep it a Jew-free concentration camp when the overcrowding happened at all the other concentration camps and they had to bring Jewish prisoners to Dachau. They worked very hard to get them out of Dachau, either by killing them or transferring them to other concentration camps, to the point where it was considered a success for the Nazis and for the SS when they were able to get all the Jews out of Dachau. Mm. The people staying at this camp were mostly political prisoners, so it would be people that challenged the Nazi party, people that challenged Hitler's authority, but also they had tons and tons of immigrant groups, uh, the Romas, the Sintis, black people, homosexuals, pretty much any group that we talk about being a victim of the Holocaust was at Dachau. Uh, But their big point was that it wasn't necessarily a Jewish camp because they didn't want Jews staying in Dachau near Munich. Hmm. As we made our way through the museum, we eventually read just the transition throughout the Holocaust, throughout World War II, kind of how the camp changed over time with the overcrowding and with as all these new prisoners were brought in and to eventually the liberation of the camp as well. So Dachau was actually liberated by American soldiers. Yay us. (laughs) us. (laughs) Uh, But, (laughs) you know, many of the camps had different stories as well. Auschwitz that we'll talk about was actually liberated by the Soviet Red Army. So, you know, it was kind of a unified effort to liberate all the camps together. But Dachau, once it was liberated, was actually used as a prison for Nazi leaders uh, waiting trial um, once they were kind of brought to justice. But the last main story I have, I guess, about this museum aspect of it, I know I'm going a lot into our trip here, but I think it's it was an interesting experience that, uh, I don't know, I would encourage anyone who 
makes their way over there to check out. Yeah. Uh, the last main story within this museum aspect was actually the original gate that I mentioned earlier. The one we walked through, we found out was just kind of a, a recreation of the original gate yeah. because the gate had been stolen <laughs> at oh, some really? point in the early 2000s and just disappeared. But they randomly found it in Amsterdam in like 2014 or something. Someone stole it in the middle of the night stashed it in amsterdam someone else found it and wow alerted is it like <laughs> the, stolen the to who... sell for money or like political I would reasons assume no I, I think it was just kind of like a i don't know someone who recognized the historical value of it and thought they could sell it or something but eventually it was found and returned to the camp and it's now kept in the museum kind of a weird little story but it was interesting to see the actual front gate even though we didn't actually walk through it Outside of this first building, <laughs> I promise that was the long building. That's where we spent the majority of our time at the camp, but it was very interesting to read all that. But outside this main building in the the center area there, which was kind of like the roll call area, that's where all the prisoners would line up every single morning to be counted, to make sure that everyone was there, to be punished publicly, things like that. Um, there is now a monument that it was under construction or renovation when we were there so we didn't actually see the monument but they did have giant banners with pictures of it a couple other monuments that have been put up there in more recent years of course that talk about you know the things that took place there and how they should be remembered and should never be forgotten um, and then as we made our way through the camp a little bit more those long rectangles in the diagram those were the barracks that's where people would stay i already mentioned that they were intended to house 200 people but Later on, they, of course, held up to 2,000 people in each of those Jeez. barracks just by the massive overcrowding that they had there. And then as you make your way to the back, there's a couple of modern religious sites that are there now, chapels and other houses of worship for all religions, pretty much. Um, those were obviously installed much later on because of kind of, we talked about that idea of preserving what's there, but trying to make it respectful and to recognize kind of the atrocities that took place there. And as you go all the way to the back of the grounds on the left is probably the hardest part that we walk through, and that's the crematorium area. It is slightly outside of the main camp, so we actually had to walk across the the trenches that they have surrounding the camp that made them so difficult to escape. It would be, mm -hmm. you know, a, an area of grass that the prisoners were not all allowed on and then there would be a deep trench that they would have to climb across and then on the other side of that would be electrified barbed wire and then on the other side of the fence was another trench so any prisoner attempting Jeez. to escape or even stepping into that first grassy area that would approach the fence would be immediately shot by a guard in one of the guard towers that surrounded the camp anyway as, as we walked across that to get to the crematorium area um there's this space was very difficult to walk through. Um, and I'm not really one to say that about things because I don't think I'm the most emotional person about a lot of things. <laughs> but uh, just walking through it was just, you, you read all the stuff about the gas chambers or the mass killings, but seeing the evidence of it in person was something totally different. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a tomb of I think it, I think it was a tomb of an unknown prisoner that kind of similar to what we have in a lot of countries have with a, a tomb that for a person who cannot be recognized a person who cannot be named to symbol all those people who cannot be recognized or named but then just beyond that is the first crematorium building and this was when it really hit me how modern this building is like when we talk about history you see a lot of when we went to Athens when we went to Rome you see those buildings and you think this is ancient history these, yeah. This is so cool, like all these old buildings. This was a modern building that was built in 1940, and you look at it and it looks modern. My house mm. was built in the 1940s. Yeah. <laughs> this building is less than 10 years older than my house. And that was just, that's when it really hit me that there are people today who lived in this, that went through this. And that was really hard. But beyond that, like this first crematorium building, they we found out was the first one because it was too small it didn't fit their purposes it mm. did, wasn't enough for what they were doing at this camp so then we went into the much larger building um which had several different rooms in it um 
I mean, it, it's kind of graphic to go through all of it, but just the, these rooms that were used for sanitation and then eventually kind of just rooms to gather people together, kind of like a corral, and then eventually into what was told to be showers. Um, and walking through that was probably the hardest part because you just kind of, I mean, I can't even imagine being a prisoner in that situation and not knowing what was happening. Yeah. Like they got the sense that people went in there and didn't come back, but they didn't know why, or they didn't know why they had been selected for this that other prisoners hadn't. Um, and it was just very, you recognized where you were as you walked through it. And then of course, beyond that would be the, the larger crematorium where they of course disposed of bodies, which I will say the important note about Dachau is that it was never an extermination camp. They did not do mass exterminations at Dachau the way they did at Auschwitz and some of the other camps. Um, that's not saying that these areas were never used. They right. did <laughs> kill quite a few prisoners at Dachau, but it was never to the scale of Auschwitz. Um, and then the final thing that we really did to wrap this up was just beyond, once you got outside the crematorium, there were a couple of these mass graves, like, and not that you could see anything today. They're, they're more religious sites now, but there was a Jewish grave because it's, that's big in the Jewish religion that, you know, Jewish people are buried separately from non-Jewish people. Mm. Um, so there's what's recognized as a Jewish grave. And then there's a, a Christian and other religion, uh, graves. And then there's an area where would have believed to be like a firing squad line and a couple other just really just hard parts to look at, hard things to see and to remember. Um, and then as we made our way out, that's, I want to say that the whole time that we were back in this crematorium area, I don't think Rita and I spoke <laughs> to each other or yeah. especially to anyone else. Um, but as we made our way back, we kind of talked about, you know, what we'd been through, what we'd seen. Um, and I'm absolutely glad that we did go see this. I don't know what it would be like to go to a place like Auschwitz that was much larger and had a lot more tragedy. Um, yeah. I don't know, but that's where we talked about the idea of are these places that we should preserve? And I, I think yes, but at the same time, I can't imagine having lived there or survived it and then going back, even knowing that it's just a museum now. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, I guess I don't know, but I can't imagine many people who actually went through that visit these museums, right? Like, right. Oh yeah. But what was interesting too, I mean, there's so many pictures, like there, there are pictures from the liberation of former prisoners kind of showing American soldiers what things were like in the camp and what the different buildings were some of them posing in places that they would have been or different scenes that would, they would have lived through just to kind of give people an idea of what they experienced. And I sense that it's because they had just been liberated, but you could see, you know, the, the excitement and the joy on these people's faces, even though they are reenacting some of the most horrible experiences that they ever would experience in their lives, just knowing that, they were on their way out that they were now freed. You could see like in these photographs of these people that, you know, were barely living, you could see the joy on their face of having been free. Yeah. So as I've said, we are not talking about Dachau on this episode. We are talking about Auschwitz. So I wanted to just kind of give a little quick comparison between the two, because obviously Auschwitz was as, as grave as, as Dachau was and the experience that we had there, Auschwitz was, I think, much worse <laughs> being an extermination camp and being a much larger camp right. on itself. So just to compare the two, I wanted to include a couple number numbers here at the end of section one, uh, just so that people get an idea of how different and how bad Auschwitz was. I mentioned that Dachau opened in 1933. It was one of the oldest concentration camps. Auschwitz didn't open until 1940. So seven years later, and then both camps were liberated in 1945 when the Nazi party was defeated in World War II. But to compare those numbers with 
Dachau being open more than twice as long, Dachau had 188,000 prisoners over the 12 years that it was in operation. Auschwitz had 1.3 million prisoners. (laughs) Almost close to 10 times as much. Dachau, like I said, was not an extermination camp, although many prisoners did die there. It's estimated that 41,500 people died at Dachau. And those numbers are hard to calculate, too, because that doesn't include accidental deaths. It doesn't include people that died while working. These are just what was reported by the SS and then what was able to be estimated by the armies that liberated the camps. So 41,500 deaths at Dachau compared to 1.1 million at Auschwitz. That's about 85% of the people that went to Auschwitz were killed there. And it was around for a lot less time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what these extermination camps were. And there weren't a ton of these concentration camps that were extermination camps. But people that went there went there to be killed. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, letting me talk about my (laughs) vacation. I promise it was more fun than that. (laughs) But I think it's important to have those experiences as well. And definitely something that I will probably never forget. But I think our listeners probably want to hear about history and not about Phil's (laughs) vacation stories. (laughs) So we'll take a short break and then we'll get into today's B-Sider, who is the Auschwitz Volunteer. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. Just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show... We sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. At buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or $100 a year. Being a member gains you some pretty cool perks. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, History's B-Side Battles, access to our future episode queue, a name shout out on a future episode. We'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set, and more perks will be announced as we continue on. There's also some different extras that people can get on our Buy Me A Coffee website. Things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah. You owe me a coffee. Oh, do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. All right, welcome back. I figure we should probably talk about some history on this episode as well, rather than just me talking about traveling. Yeah. And I mean, if you if you bared through that, we appreciate you. I appreciate you. Uh, This is one of my favorite B-siders that we've done. I'm glad it's our 50th episode because I feel like that's some kind of a landmark and he's definitely someone that's worthy of knowing and talking about and I think he fits our theme very, very well. The person we're talking about today is a man by the name of Witold Pilecki. He was born on May 13th, 1901 in Olenets, Kralia, which was a part of the Russian Empire. His parents were Julian Pilecki and Ludwika (laughs) Osiemskia. There's going to be tons and tons of (laughs) Polish and Russian and Lithuanian names in this, and it's going to be tough. (laughs) But his parents 
his parents were two very patriotic Polish Catholics. So it's important to note here that Pilecki himself was not Jewish. He was Catholic. In 1910, his mother and his four siblings moved to Vilno, which today Vilno is the capital of Lithuania. Then it was considered a part of the Russian Empire, although Lithuania was demanding and fighting for its own political autonomy. In 1916, Pilecki's mother sent him to school in the Russian city of Oriol, but he returned to Vilno in 1918, which had been occupied by Germany during World War I. By now, though, it was a part of the newly independent Polish Second Republic. And this is where Pilecki kind of starts to establish his loyalty to Poland and his patriotism there. In his younger years, Pilecki served in the Zwiatek Harcestwa Polskiego, which was the Polish Scouting and Guiding Association known better as ZHP. That's one of the benefits of this episode is that a lot of these Polish named organizations are known by their three abri- three initials. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to refer to them by that throughout the episode. So this was like kind of like the Boy Scouts of America. Yeah, that's actually how I took it. Uh, and I think they made that comparison as well. He would have been a little bit older than we portray Boy Scouts, but it was kind of like that organized young men developing into a type of military-esque upbringing. Mm-hmm. After the Germans were ousted from Vilno in 1918, the ZHP tried unsuccessfully to defend the city from the Soviet Red Army. Were there other countries that the Red Army occupied in between the two world wars? I guess I'm kind of fuzzy on the Soviet side of World War II. So we talked about this a little bit in the Fighting Girlfriend episode. Mm -hmm. In this time in history, the Russian Empire was kind of falling to a Russian Revolution, Russian Civil War that would turn into the Soviet Union. So in like 1918 specifically, I don't know that it was necessarily the Soviet Union, but it was like early communist Russia. And they were starting to kind of infiltrate some of these Eastern European countries. I don't know how many of them they actually occupied per se, but they were definitely spreading influence in them and trying to make them a part of what would soon be the Soviet Union. Gotcha. Pilecki himself enlisted behind Soviet lines in the Polish Volunteer Army, and he fought in the Polish-Soviet War in 1919 and later participated in the liberation of Vilno. So I guess my question was who won this war, but based on the wording of that, the liberation of Vilno, is it safe to assume that Poland won that war? Yeah, so Poland won the polish soviet war and this specifically the liberation of vilna was when the polish army would have pushed the soviets out of that specific city okay following the polish soviet war pilecki transferred to the army reserves but he was promoted to the ranks of corporal ensign and second lieutenant Hmm. in 1931 he married maria ostrowska and they had two children andre and zofia He founded a farmer's association. He was a poet and a painter and opened a horseman training school. He also commanded a military training squadron, which became part of the Polish 19th Infantry Division in 1937. And in 1938, he received the Silver Cross of Merit to recognize his service to Poland. So the war hasn't even started yet, and he's already done. Yeah, he's (laughs) decorated. He's involved in, you know, kind of the Polish military. He's pretty important and obviously has that knowledge and background of military organization and strategy, I guess, that's going to benefit him later in life. When World War II broke out, specifically on August 26, 1939, Pilecki was mobilized as a cavalry platoon commander in the 19th Infantry Division to defend against the German invasion of Poland. The 19th Division was badly defeated on the night of September 5th, Pilecki and its remaining soldiers joined the 41st Division where he served as second-in-command of its cavalry detachment. With this group, he and his men destroyed seven German tanks and three aircrafts, but when Soviet forces invaded East Poland on September 17th, the Polish army was stretched too thin and the 41st Division was defeated only a few days later. And we talked about this as well in that Fighting Girlfriend episode where the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, which essentially divided Poland between Germany and the Soviet Union. At least those two nations pick and chose what 
parts of Poland that they wanted to have for themselves. Pilecki was among a small group of soldiers who defied orders to retreat to France, and this group of soldiers remained underground in Poland and would later form the Tyna Armia Polska, or the TAP, which was essentially the secret Polish army. The TAP was one of the first underground organizations of the Polish resistance. Pilecki served as an organizational commander and later an inspector and chief of staff. But to keep his cover, he worked as a manager of a cosmetics storehouse, which I think is really funny that <laughs> the secret <laughs> secret military organization he had to work as like a cosmetics manager <laughs> yeah. so that people didn't know what he was really doing. Pilecki had a dispute with one of the TAP leaders, Major Jan Voldarkiewicz. Pilecki accused Voldarkiewicz of having anti-Semitic nationalist views and he suggested that they should align with another Polish resistance group, the Union of Armed Struggle, which called for equal rights for Jews and focused on gathering intelligence of German atrocities. Voldarkiewicz instead insisted that the future of Poland had to be Christian, based on national identity, and that those opposed to this idea should be, quote, removed from our lands. Hmm. Which is kind of scary, ominous, similar to the views that, I guess, Hitler would have had. Yeah. Um, obviously, Hitler was very hell-bent on taking over Europe <laughs> for his nationalist views of Germany. And, I don't know, this type of viewpoint probably wasn't that uncommon for people in their own respective nations. I mean, there are still nationalist viewpoints today. But as a resistance army that was fighting against this type of nationalist view, I can understand why Pilecki and others would be worried about one of their leaders having that viewpoint. Right. Pilecki refused to back this ideology, so Voldarkiewicz nominated Pilecki for a mission to infiltrate the Auschwitz concentration camp. And it's important to note that this was not an order that Pilecki had to go to Auschwitz, but rather positioned as an invitation to volunteer for this mission. Pilecki viewed this suggestion, though, as punishment for disagreeing with Voldarkiewicz. Do you think this is true? Uh, yes. I mean, I... Mm. I can't imagine why anyone would really want to go to Auschwitz. <laughs> uh, right. Obviously, it would have been important and strategic for the secret Polish army. But I still don't think anyone would necessarily volunteer for this mission on their own. Right. Regardless, Pilecki agreed to do it. So whether he viewed it as a punishment or not, he made the choice to go to Auschwitz. And today he's considered the only known person in history to voluntarily go to Auschwitz. <laughs> also at this time, though, Auschwitz was believed to be a POW camp or just a really, really large prison, probably more mm. similar to how Dachau actually was. It was not known the actual atrocities that were being committed there to the general public, to these secret military organizations, to the actual allied armies that were fighting against the germans right. so yeah that the really wasn't public knowledge that auschwitz was as bad of a thing as it was as we know it is today but when several polish political opponents had been imprisoned at auschwitz their families soon received telegrams that they had died at the camp and this really led to polish resistance forces becoming suspicious and they wanted to investigate the camp which is why pilecki was nominated for this mission hmm. So on September 19th, 1940, Pilecki purposely got himself arrested during a street roundup in Warsaw. He was arrested along with over 1,700 others over just a few days. To protect his own identity, Pilecki used the ID papers for Tomasz Serafinski, a man that Pilecki believed to be dead. So he was booked into Auschwitz under Serafinski's name and tattooed as prisoner number 4859. Pilecki would spend the next two and a half years living in Auschwitz. His reports described the lice-ridden hospital ward as well as his suffering from pneumonia and typhus. Inside the camp, he formed an underground military resistance organization called Zviatsek Organizatsi Wojskowoj, or ZOW. Their mission included improving inmate morale, providing news from the outside, distributing extra food and clothing, and setting up intelligence networks. Do you know if they ever used a Monopoly game? <laughs> Call back to our uh, second ever episode. Yeah, my first uh, my first topic, Lizzie Maggi. I don't think they ever used Monopoly, or not to my knowledge. Was mm -hmm. those used in the concentration camps? I think it was POW. 
Oh, okay. Because it was primarily Americans yeah. that would have been bringing them over. That's true. Well, that probably wouldn't have been Auschwitz then. <laughs> Maybe Dachau. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> the ZOW began to merge with other non-Polish resistance groups inside of Auschwitz. Its members were kept secret even from each other by design. So basically what I read was that they were in, I forget what they called them, but they were groups of five members. And these five members knew each other, but they didn't know anyone else that was in the ZOW. And there were Mm. lots and lots of these groups, but nobody really knew who else was in the group. And the purpose of that was that if any of them were arrested, the Gestapo wouldn't have been able to kill all of them. They would only be able to go after the, the four other people that knew that they were working together. So it was how, a way to accomplish the mission while protecting each other. How did they communicate with one another if they were, you know, if they didn't know who the other groups were? <laughs> That's a great question. One that I don't know. I have to assume hmm. that Pilecki and probably some other maybe leaders in this ZOW group knew at least more than just four other members. So yeah. they probably reported to someone that would have been a leader in this group, and that's kind of how they organized their information. Okay. By the spring of 1942, the ZOW had over 1,000 members living in the camp. Later that year, the Gestapo took notice and began to discover and kill its members. Pilecki wrote reports on the conditions and treatment of prisoners within the camp as well. These reports would be smuggled out by prisoners who Pilecki helped escape from the camp, Then they would take his reports to the leaders of the resistance army. Hmm. I also want to explain here that they initially started with the policy of not escaping from Auschwitz. They didn't want to do that. Uh, The reason being that any time a prisoner escaped, the mass prisoners remaining in the camp would be punished for that. So rather to protect the the life and well-being of the masses inside the camp, they weren't trying to escape the camp. They were just trying to get information out through one means or another. Yeah. Eventually, these escapes from the camp became, I'm not saying it was a, a huge thing, but like became so numerous that they weren't able to continue to punish everyone in the camp. And because the number of people in the camp were just astronomical, that they couldn't continually punish the entire camp because escapes happened. So once they stopped punishing the mass of prisoners inside the camp because someone escaped, then Pilecki and the ZOW worked to help people escape and actually carry the information out of the camp. His reports would describe the starvation, harsh treatment, and ongoing extermination of prisoners. They tracked specific numbers of arrivals and deaths from the camp, and they explained how food was rationed, intended to only keep prisoners alive for six weeks. They actually calculated how much food a person would need to survive for six weeks and then die in the camp. And the they believe that if this. someone, yep, and they believe that if someone died or survived beyond six weeks, that they would have been stealing food or doing something they, they shouldn't have and been punished for it. Wow. Pilecki eventually established a secret radio transmitter, which was built from equipment smuggled into the camp and used it to relay messages to the resistance army. Do you know how they were smuggling these things into the camp? No. I mean, that that was something that was weird to me. I don't know how they would have gotten it past their initial registration where they were confiscating all these personal artifacts. So I don't maybe they were found some way to pass it before they actually got to <laughs> registration or something. But yeah, um, it's still really incredible that they were able to set this up and send messages directly from inside the camp. Even though this didn't last particularly long, uh, Pilecki recognized that they would soon be caught for establishing this, and I think it only they only used it for I think seven months was the number that I read. That's a long time though. Yeah, I mean, it would have been something that they probably had to tear down and hide after every time they used it. His hope in relaying all this information was to inspire an aerial assault by allies or Polish forces to liberate the camp. His resistance movement inside the camp was trained to aid an uprising if aid forces ever did arrive. But no such relief forces or even messages of promised aid ever came. By the spring of 1943... Gestapo forces began to discover and kill many of the ZOW members. Knowing that he would die if he remained in the camp any longer, Pilecki plotted his escape. So, while working a camp bakery shift on the night of April 26, 1943, he and two other prisoners forced open a metal door, overpowered a guard, 
cut the telephone lines, and escaped. They took with them some documents that they had stolen from the Germans, as well as cyanide pills they had planned to consume if they were caught. German soldiers fired at them as they escaped, and Pilecki was wounded by a bullet, but it didn't hit anything vital. Hmm. The men fled by foot east to Bochnia, Poland, which was about 62 miles away, to a safe house owned by, ironically, Commander Tomasz Serafinski. Oh, so the guy whose <laughs> ID he stole. <laughs> yeah, so he I mean, he believed that he was dead, but I'm assuming this guy was a member of this Polish resistance force and just kind of mm. had to go into hiding. So yeah. that's why his ID was available. <laughs> it's wild that he gets shot and then proceeds to hike 62 miles to this place. <laughs> well, I think the the evidence that he was shot was basically through scratches or bullet holes in his clothing. It didn't hit mm-hmm. any bones or any organs, obviously. Also worth noting that they didn't go 62 miles like overnight. I think it sure. took them like six or seven days to get to the safe house. They made stops at two other towns before they got there. But still, like 62 miles is 100 kilometers, I think. Like that's a long hike <laughs> yeah. in a week after you've spent two and a half years living in a very harsh concentration camp. Jeez. While at this safe house, Pilecki continued to try persuading, unsuccessfully, mind you, <laughs> for the Polish resistance army to liberate Auschwitz. In June of 1943, he wrote Report W, which is today known as Witold's Report. And this described in detail his ZOW resistance group, his own experiences, and how Jews and other prisoners were being exterminated. I found a couple quotes from Vietold's report that I wanted to include here, because kind of like I talked about at the National Socialist Museum that we went to in Munich, is hearing these words from survivors or people that lived through this is much more powerful than anything that I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Or that, I mean anything that you'll read in a history book. And even though it's going to be coming through my voice, these are the actual words of Witold Pilecki on what he experienced in Auschwitz. So on his plan to establish the ZOW, he said, quote, In that time, the basic task was to establish a military organization in order to keep up the spirits of my colleagues by the delivery and dissemination of news from the outside by the organization to the best of our ability of additional food and distribution of underwear among those organized, transmission of news to the outside, and, as the crown of that all, the preparation of our units to seize the camp when it became the order of the day, when an order to drop weapons or to land troops was given. So they were ready. <laughs> yeah. They were ready for aid to come, and then they would seize the camp when that happened. He also talked about the hunger that they felt inside the camp when he said, quote, I probably fought the hardest battle of my life. The problem was how to eat now and leave something for the morning. Oh, intensity of hunger goes through the entire scale of gradations. Sometimes one felt that he would be capable of cutting out a piece of a dead body lying near the hospital. This is hard to comprehend. Like, that level of hunger that you'd start considering eating dead flesh. Right. I I mean... It's not human. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like this isn't, these are normal people. They didn't ask for this. They didn't, they weren't the type of people that would ever consider that under normal, normal circumstances. And it just goes to show that they were pushed to their literal survival limits inside these camps. Continuing on the hunger quote, I have to confess here that, for the first time, it seemed to me that I had not enough strength to go on fighting, to fight at all. I was in a dangerous psychological state. To have doubts about the sense of fighting means to break down. When I noticed that, I revived. I continued crushing lice on my neck and legs. Jesus. And that one stuck out to me because this is where he's actually questioning, you know, what this has all been about. He's been fighting as part of this Polish resistance underground movement for a long time, a lot longer than he's been in Auschwitz. And he volunteered for this, sort of volunteered for this. Like, he didn't have to be here. He wasn't, he wasn't even Jewish. (laughs) He purposely got arrested to go to Auschwitz for this purpose of helping the people that were in the camp and to try to liberate it 
and he is suffering just because he was committed to this cause. And he recognizes that once he gives up on this cause, the, the idea that what is this all worth, that's, that's what they want. That's the purpose of these camps is to break you down and to make you no longer willing to fight. Yeah. Pilecki would return to action when the Warsaw Uprising broke out on October 1st, 1944. This was an attempt by the Polish resistance army to liberate Warsaw from German occupation. When the uprising failed, he was captured and taken to a German POW camp, and he remained here until the end of the war, when Germany had been defeated and the camps were liberated. And that's it. Happy ending. Nothing more to talk about. We're so far into this episode. (laughs) We can wrap up his story here, right? I don't know. You tell me. You're the host. (laughs) Well, it's history's B-side and nothing is happy. So no. (laughs) Unfortunately, Pilecki's story, as amazing as he is, his story does not have a very happy end to it. So we will continue on. Once he was liberated in July of 1945, Pilecki joined the Polish armed forces in Ancona, Italy. But back home in Poland, when the Germans no longer controlled the country, the Soviets moved in and took over. And this led Pilecki to return to Warsaw in December of 1945 and establish an intelligence network with former ZOW and TAP members, which he hoped would eventually overthrow the Soviet occupation. Eventually, he would be arrested by communist authorities on May 8, 1947. He was then tortured in order to get his confession for charges including, among other things, illegal border crossing, espionage, and plotting to assassinate government officials. In March of 1948, authorities held a show trial aimed at publicly humiliating Pilecki and also to deter future detractors. Hmm. He was sentenced to death and executed by being shot in the back of the head on May 25th, 1948, at the Mokotov prison in Warsaw. Dang. Out of one frying pan and into another. Yeah. I mean, he literally went to Auschwitz by his own accord, (laughs) escaped, suffered there, escaped, went to a POW camp, was liberated, went back home, was arrested and killed. Dang. It's not an easy life for... He told Pilecki. What's interesting about his story, beyond what we've already <laughs> gone through, is that his burial place is unknown. And that's intentional, because as the Soviets remained in occupation of Poland, he, his story was buried. His life was kept quiet as long as communism persisted in the country. And even his original draft of Witold's report had been buried at the safe house in Bochnia and not discovered until after his death and many years later. After communism finally collapsed in Poland in 1990, Pilecki's story was first told publicly. On October 1st, 1990, he was posthumously acquitted of all charges. In 1995, he was awarded the Commander's Cross of the Order of Polonia Restituta, And in 2006, he was awarded the Order of the White Eagle, which is Poland's highest honor for military or civilians. Witold's report was first published in the year 2000 and translated to English in 2012. And since his actions have become publicly known, several monuments have been erected to Pilecki in Poland, as well as books and films published telling his story. Any good films we should know about to check out? (laughs) I haven't seen any of them. Um, I think that the majority of them are in Polish, but if there are Mm. subtitles, I think they would absolutely be worth checking out. One interesting one that I did find was actually from a story by NPR. And if you want to Google this, uh, I think the article is titled Meet the Man Who Sneaked Into Auschwitz by NPR. And they have a little five minute segment where they actually interview the actor who played Pilecki in the film. Mm. And it's really interesting because after basically portraying his life, near the end of the film they say that he the actor starts speaking as himself not as Pilecki but as the actor himself and what it meant to kind of reenact what Pilecki experienced and he is viewed as sort of like a Polish national hero now Um, obviously it's a story that was buried for 40 plus years after he died because of who was in control of Poland but now that his story is known and it's public 
He's viewed as this man who literally gave his life. He suffered <laughs> not just for Poland, but for all the people that were in prison in Auschwitz. And he worked very hard to try to liberate those people essentially on his own without any help from the Allied forces or from the secret Polish army. <laughs> Yeah. And it's a man who was who was killed for these actions. He was always trying to liberate Poland, but obviously, you know, paid the ultimate price for it. So do you uh do you feel prepared for your quiz? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what what are you gonna ask me about? Uh, I, I actually have two Vitold Polecki questions. Oh no. And then one that's about you know, concentration camps. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually the hardest of the three, so. <laughs> Great. I think. We better wrap this up, because uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to hold people's attention here. All right. We'll take a short break, and then we'll get back to the quiz in just a moment. When we decided to make a podcast, the first thing we did was download Anchor. Because we have no money, and Anchor is free. You can also record and edit your podcast right from your phone or a computer. Then, it only takes one click to share your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. And because we have no money, Anchor helps pair us with advertisers and lets our listeners support the History's B-Side podcast directly on our page. If you've got an idea for your own podcast, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right, welcome back. So as most of you know, we like to end every episode with a short quiz for our host to see how well he's prepared and what he's learned, and also for our listeners to give themselves a chance to test their historical knowledge. How do you feel about today's quiz, Phil? <laughs> I feel like I read a lot about Vitold Pilecki. This was definitely one of the topics that fascinated me the most especially considering yeah. you know the recent trip that we took. So I I definitely dove into his story. Makes me nervous if you have questions about him that I missed. <laughs> so I guess we'll see. Yeah, I mean, if you read a lot about Poletsky specifically, you might know the answer to questions 2 and 3. Um <laughs> they weren't like or they don't seem like they're super deep cuts. <laughs> But we'll see how you do on those. Uh, the The first question I have for you, I think, is probably the most difficult just because it requires multiple answers. <laughs> is it going to be like name all the concentration camps? Because no, just six of them. <laughs> oh, good. I, uh, I tried so, to remember them from what we saw in the uh, in the museum, but I don't remember very many of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll specify my question and see if that maybe gives you a little bit of help. But there were over a thousand different Nazi concentration camps, if you include the sub camps that usually surrounded the major ones. But only six of them were designated by the Nazis themselves as death camps or extermination camps. And all six of them were in Poland. Can you name them or how many can you name? And the first hint I'll give you is that like you said, Dachau was not considered. Yeah, an, well, Dachau wasn't in Poland camp. either. <laughs> Fair, that's true. Uh, yeah, well, that was interesting because there was a map inside of that main building that I talked about. The, I mean, it, on the diagram it was referred to as like the kitchen, but it was the main like registration building and everything. And the map had all of the camps and all the sub camps around them. So you kind of see how big these complexes were or the areas that they were. However, I am really drawing a blank on the names of other concentration camps right now besides those two, which is terrible because if you asked me when we were not recording and I hadn't just re read a ton <laughs> of stuff about <laughs> one specific person in one specific concentration camp, I could probably name more. Yeah. But on the spot, I think uh, I think I'm drawing a blank. So, I mean, you can definitely name the one. That well, we talked about today. Yeah. Um, I only knew two of these. So I knew Auschwitz, Birkenau, which were considered two in the, two in the same. Um, or one in the same, I guess I should say. And then I knew of Treblinka. 
Ah, uh, Treblinka, yes. The other four were Kelmno, Belzik, Sobibor, and Majdanic. And like I said, yeah. all of those were Wouldn't in... have gotten those. <laughs> I've never heard of those ones, but... And I also didn't know they were all... At least all the death camps were in Poland. When we were looking at that map, I remember seeing... What was it? Sachsen, Sachsenhausen, something like that. But it was mm. whatever camp that Mad Jack Churchill was taken to and then escaped from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that stuck out to me too. So it's funny, like we've talked about a lot of these topics. And I mean, this is like the fourth or fifth World War II related episode that we've done now. But interesting to see history come together and the people that we've talked about. Yeah. So for your second question regarding Witold Pilecki, we talked about how he was sending messages to the allies trying to describe the conditions in the camp and asking for aid, whether it was an aerial bomb or, you know, Polish forces coming in to liberate the camp. But more specifically, his first message out asked the allies to do what? Um, don't remember seeing anything about his first message. Would it have just been to like bring supplies, bring food and other supplies? It was not. It was more in the aerial assault side of things. Oh. (laughs) So while he eventually got to the point where he was suggesting that the can't be liberated. The first message he sent out or the first request he sent out was pretty blunt. He basically asked them to bomb the entire camp, um, which would mean killing himself and his entire resistance force and everybody in it. But because the conditions were so horrifying, he insisted that the Nazis had to be stopped at any cost and that frankly, it would be merciful if they were to bomb the entire camp. So I actually remember reading that as a military strategy that was discussed by the Allies. I didn't realize mm-hmm. it was Piletsky himself that suggested it. Yeah. Which, which is, is kind of crazy. Like, I mean, yeah, that shows you the conditions that they lived in, that he was like, it is better for us to die than to, you know, let this to continue. Yeah. Uh, I think obviously, I mean, clearly through what we know in history that that plan didn't happen, but they decided that they didn't want to actively kill victims if they could but i think the case could also be made that by not acting quicker they did kill some victims <laughs> um but i don't know they the allies did not know how bad auschwitz was right even while Pilatsky was there and sending them reports but yeah i mean i agree with you that's why i wanted to include this as a question because it kind of speaks to how poor and horrible the conditions were inside the camp that he was like please bomb it like it would be a blessing (laughs) and it would have had to be pretty early on in him staying there because he established the zow like almost immediately (laughs) yeah like within his first month or two being at the camp and for your third and final question and kind of interesting and quirky question so we talked about his imprisonment at auschwitz and his number being four eight five nine But there was something about this number that he considered lucky, even though his companions perceived them as an omen of impending death. Can you tell me what he considered lucky about the number 4859? (laughs) You must have found some website that I did not. (laughs) I don't remember seeing anything about that. The first one was from a Washington Post article about... The told Polensky. Uh, I don't subscribe to the Washington Post and I couldn't look at that article. I got paywalled. Oh, really? I don't, it didn't paywall me and I definitely don't subscribe to the Washington oh, Post. Oh, man. I definitely clicked on that and it, it wouldn't let me look at it. Weird. Um, and then the other one is from a book called The Driest of Facts The Told Polensky's Mission in Auschwitz. Oh. Would it have been like a date of some sort? Like the numbers symbolized a date of. It was not a date. I don't know. (laughs) That's my only guess. (laughs) So this is super random. And honestly, I would have been really impressed if you just randomly guessed this because it wouldn't have been something I would think of. But what he thought was lucky about the number was that the 
inner digits added together and the outer digits added together both added up to 13. So 4, 8, 5, 9, you split into 4 and 9 and 8 and 5. And well, that's I mean, what... 13 is lucky in some cultures. Yeah. It's just not an American culture. But why split it up like that, right? Like, why would why not add the first I mean, two numbers and then the third and fourth number? Spend enough time in a concentration camp, you're going to start noticing whatever patterns <laughs> are constantly around you. <laughs> I guess that's fair. But yeah, I just thought that was like a quirky little like anecdote that he thought the numbers... Yeah. I didn't come across that. That's cool. I don't think I've gotten a quiz question right in like several weeks. (laughs) I think I'm just bad at finding like appropriate quiz questions because I feel (laughs) like I mean these are fine. You had two of the questions were about Pilecki himself. That's fair. (laughs) I'm struggling. I'm focusing too much on my main topic and not around it either. I get the quiz. I, I do. I don't even know if I do better. I haven't paid attention to how I do, but you, you lose the quiz questions. I lose during our monthly bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want the monthly bonus episode, there are some different ways that you can find it by supporting the podcast, which you've heard about on our ads and outro and everything like that. But if you want more from History's B Side, we. Certainly appreciate that you guys are listening diligently and following along with our research and are talking about what we've learned. You can find more about us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all at Histories B Side, or write to us, Histories B Side at gmail.com. If, uh, if you want to leave us a review and tell us how great we are, or mediocre, or whatever. <laughs> Go for it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, write to us and tell us how mediocre we are. (laughs) Hey, I'll take it. Constructive criticism, right? You guys are positively average. (laughs) Phil, stop taking half an hour and talking about your vacation at the start of an episode. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you guys so much for listening. We will be back with more Histories B-Side next week. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.